So welcome everyone. Hi Kelly. Welcome to this lovely waste of time. No more a waste of time than anything else. Really, no time to waste. Isn't that wonderful? So wasting your time that you were always chastised for, weren't you? Stop wasting your time. How many times did you get that as a child? <laughs> Stop wasting your precious time. Time's limited, you know. Do something constructive. Something purposeful. Stop just looking out the window, daydreaming. So you've heard that um, there's nothing to be done. <laughs> well, there's anything to be done. It's just that nothing is more purposeful, meaningful, significant, important than anything else. Doing just happens or not, and not doing <laughs> is not better or worse than doing, unless you say so. Rest assured, there'll be plenty of people who will tell you what you should be doing, what you could be doing to improve your life. And if not improve your life, at least make the world a better place, which just means do what they like. But really, life is only seemingly seeming to move forward, to progress or regress. There really is no progress. You've never progressed. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's, you could say that's the greatest relief of all. For the one who tried so hard to be good, to be the best version of themselves, to fulfill my potential. It's a dreadful curse. And we were all heavily conditioned and indoctrinated to believe that it was within our power to make my life work. Well, life, it turns out, isn't a job. There's no work. Work's useful for paying the bills. And if you love your work, then of course you're very fortunate, but really life is not a job. And the one who says that it is a job and has made it my job to be a success, however I've envisaged what success would look like, 
is a pain in the ass. More than that. This, whatever this is, this being alive, this being, this life, this aliveness, has no requirements. Doesn't recognize any action as better than another. Doesn't recognize any action, full stop. And I, <laughs> it is a relief, but it can feel devastating if it's obvious that life has never known you, doesn't recognize you, can't see you, can't acknowledge you. And so you've always looked to others, other human beings for that. And so if you, if it becomes obvious that life can't see you, that's, that's, that can be, feel, can feel devastating, but not as devastating as all the ones that you've loved, that you do love and have loved. They never saw you either. They never knew you. They can't know you. The whole illusion that you could be known and seen by another simply comes from the illusion, the, the very convincing illusion, the conviction that I know myself. And because I know myself and I am real, the other could see the real me. I could be seen. You cannot be seen. You do not exist as a thing, an entity that could be known by another entity. Now, I don't mean this on a, I don't mean that you can't know other human beings. You know of other human beings, you know of their behavior, you know of their habits, you know of their likes and dislikes, you know of the similarities between what you like and they like, and whether it feels good to be around them. I'm not talking about the absence of that. I'm simply saying there are no other selves. Not that there are some human beings with a self and some without. That will be, that will be just the biggest nonsense that you've ever heard. And if you've believed it before, if that belief simply dies, it's laughable. And with that, and there is great lightness, and that you could say this is the great equality, that all human beings are absolutely equally human. That's all. And the humanness That's much more apparent without the relationship between selves, the illusory relationship between me and you, which does not exist. Then the simple love of other human beings is much more apparent, very obvious, undoubted, undeniable. So when I speak of love, that's what I'm speaking of that the love of other human beings and of flowers and of dogs and of clouds and of rocks and trees and the sea and the beach <laughs> and throwing a frisbee and hitting a golf ball, if that's what's loved, is, is just 
It isn't something, love. It just is. And it is undeniable. And self always wants to deny love because I'm talking about a love that is not for you or me. It's not a love that is possessed. It's not a love that is given. It's not a love that is received. It simply is. And that's not waiting for you in some romanticized future. It is simply as it is. It's nothing to do with you. Life has nothing to do with you. Well, if you have anything you'd like me to speak about, or you've got any questions, or you just want to share something, and um, then we talk about it, that's all good. Either put your hand up, or hey, Tim. you can write in the chat. Can you talk about hope? Who's this? Kelly. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Can I talk about hope? Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. What, what do you want me to talk about? Is there hope? Uh, no. Um, I guess I've heard you talk about the meaninglessness of hope and hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, I think I just want to hear it in words again. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, if you listen to other non-duality speakers, it's very common to speak of this as hopeless. And um, it kind of makes sense why, why some, someone might say that this is hopeless, that life is hopeless, because there isn't a future. And of course, they, if there is no future, there is no hope, is there? I mean, it is that simple. I mean, I, it sounds dreadful, hopelessness, but I mean, where there just isn't a future, and so there is no hope. But of course, without a future, there's no hopeless either, because hopeless needs a future too. So in the absence of hope, if hope dies, then hopeless dies with it. Because both hope and hopelessness require a future that is hopeful or hopeless. In this, as this, just this, there is no hope of something else because there isn't anything else so in that sense there is no hope or hopelessness is that all right kelly <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I because i i know that when i started speaking about this i would say it was hopeless all the time and um, and then I then it, it really became obvious that that's slightly misleading because it's suggesting that this is hopeless, but it's not. It's the absence of hope, which is the absence of hopeless too. Just as it is, is all. 
it's, it's ridiculously simple. I mean, that might sound as though I'm just playing with words. And in a way, of course, all of this is just playing with words. But the future is required for all hope or hopelessness to appear. Thank you, that was really good. Thank you. <laughs> Having said that, of course, thoughts of hope and thoughts of hopelessness are absolutely freely free to appear. I'm not saying they don't appear, but then a, a hopeful thought, if hope isn't real, because the future, there is no future, a thought, a hopeful thought does not have the power that it would have had when the future is very real. It's just a hopeful thought or a hopeless thought. And you may have noticed that some, be, some human beings are very hopeful, optimist, and some are very full of hopelessness, pessimists. And um, what are they gonna do about that? That's just how they are. That's how a human being is. And you probably have a preference for one or the other. Strangely, I, I like pessimists because pessimists are um, generally more fun to be around. Optimists can really get on your nerves, can't they? <laughs> don't worry it'll all get better and you go well, will it really it probably won't it'll probably be a lot fucking worse and so you know this whole there's there's a lot of um there's a, there's a lot of self-help and um positive thinking around this optimism and hopefulness but uh really you're setting yourself up for disaster aren't you setting yourself up for disappointment. So the pessimists have probably got it right. Always surprised that it's not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I mean, if you could choose, which you can't, pessimism is probably healthier. Ben. Ben. Hello, mate. Hey, Tim. Good to see you. Well, good to see you. Have you had any good uh, clam chowder lately? I shall never have clam chowder again because I just want to live in the memory of that San Francisco clam chowder. Right. I mean, so if, I, if that isn't food of the gods, I don't know what is. Doesn't get any better than that. Doesn't. No. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> So I have a memory of you being here in California. Yeah, me too. That's, appear that's appearing. It's a memory. Mm -hmm. Did it ever happen? Well, you've got a memory and we could, I mean, if we met and we could bore everybody rigid with our stories of our shared memories. But would I, would I have the same memory of um, memories as, as you? No. There we are. That's the end of it, really, because that's what that's that's all we have. So you have memories that appear or not. And here there's memories that appear or not. But what would what really happened if your memories aren't the same as my memories? So what is it that really happened, Ben? You just took the whole wonder out of it, the whole. Well, actually, you made it wonder because now it, it's just so ephemeral and so ungraspable. Yeah, exactly. Well, that is the past. I mean, there you have it. And each time you, each time a memory appears to you, Ben, about our time together, it's appearing brand new and fresh. It's not 
it's not the same memory as last time you had the memory. It's really not. If this, if that becomes obvious, then immediately you can't memory the 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 solidity the the realness of memory as the past as it really happened really it just evaporates and then it's and strangely ben that's 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 much um i mean i could say it didn't really happen but then what does that mean yeah, it doesn't change all, anything. All by that I mean is all we have of what happened is a memory of what happened. And I, by the way, I include photographs and videos. They're, yeah. they're, they're just the same. Where are they happening? They're happening as they happen. Exactly, yeah. You know, it's, it's just, there's just nowhere else. This isn't happening somewhere else. In an imagined past or a remembered past. And, but strangely, the, the point I wanted to make was that the memories are more beautiful and more there's more love in them when they're not absolutely real, when they don't need to be real, because they only needed to be real so that my life has a timeline and my life is real, so my past is real. That, that's just for me. I need that. I need that reality in order to otherwise my life's not real i don't have a real life without the past being real yeah this whole communication makes me feel like every moment i have i really should appreciate more because it's what is gone is gone it's just a memory there is yeah, you can. Yeah. I, I, I said love, but you could say the preciousness. I mean, the preciousness. Mm -hmm. Yes, is the preciousness much more, is much more apparent without that reality of the past. Yeah, and even is, even more so. So we've talked about future and we've talked about past. When when they're when they're not not when they don't have the substance that for most selves they they do have, if they're if they're just stories, then they're more beautiful. And you know, it's you don't have anything else, Ben. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing makes me think of my loved ones who are gone. You know, we just had Memorial Day here. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I think of uh, my grandmother, my my dogs, my beloved dog passed away. Yeah. And all I have is the memories and photos yeah. and objects that say that they were here, they existed, but it's just happening now and appearing here now. And I don't know if that they ever actually existed. Yeah. And I didn't have the appreciation when they were here that I feel now, no. you know, now that they're not here. Well, that you, it, you, it just feels devastating. Yeah, you and the rest of us, and the, the grief of that, which is, you yeah. know, the, the grief is probably the purest expression of love that we have. If you feel the loss, and especially if you have the sense of you really wish you'd have appreciated them more when they were here. I mean, what a beautiful, ex it's a wonderful expression of love, isn't it? It breaks my heart. And it will break your heart, yeah. All of what we're speaking about is heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, this meeting here is just affecting me. Uh, when you said, first, when you said earlier in your introduction, life doesn't recognize you. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I had a contraction. Yeah. And my eyes started to well up. And I don't, I don't know why. No. And it's just like a, a sense of how true, how true, how honest that is. And devastating at the same time. Yeah. But yet also beautiful. The whole gamut. But it was just so powerful. Uh, powerfully real to me. You know, it was, it was profound. And right, I still feel devastated right now talking to you. I just feel in a state of devastation, complete 
heartbroken devastation. Yeah, it is devastating. But at the same time, it's freedom. And it doesn't make sense. No. No, it doesn't need to make sense. I haven't made sense of all of this. Thanks, Tim. Oh, thanks, Ben. No, I'm sure you. I'll talk to you in a little later. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Ben. In, in the chat, Dario says, is there, is there a difference between life and love? Hmm. I don't know. All I could say, Dario, is, um, life or love doesn't care if there's a difference or not strangely <laughs> not caring not the not caring I talk about life not being not knowing you, not recognizing you, not giving a shit about you. Well, what kind of love is that? But that is love. So <laughs> I wouldn't say love is the same as, or I wouldn't say life is the same as the way most people use the word love, but I kind of do use them. Similarly. But unconditional love when I know it sounds attractive unconditional love, you do not want unconditional love self only wants me only wants conditional love love me love me love me don't love him. <laughs> so unconditional love is a love that doesn't care not in a I doesn't I, I don't mean uncaring I don't mean that at all I mean com, utterly neutral uh, So, um, but unconditional love, of course, includes all the conditional love. So you can still love your dog much more than your neighbor's dog. Natalie has a hand up. Natalie. Hi. Hi there. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Good. Whatever that intro was, was just like literally hearing that was like so mind blowing. Just because there's there's just what is, you know, as it is. And then these ideas of like there's a right way and a wrong way and it should be like this and it shouldn't be like that and it's like that it's just so funny i don't know why 
I ever thought any of that. Why I ever thought like I'm right and they're wrong. Like, it's just so weird. Like now just, I mean, it's just like, this is it. This is it. And then maybe like there are thoughts of like, it's not good enough, but that's still whatever it is. You know, it's still just this, no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's it. That's it. No matter what. Yeah. 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 I like Good that. Scene. Yeah. I like it. Razia. You know, the speaker also feels that there is, that the introduction was very powerful. I felt it as well. Uh, can you hear me? Um, your little quiet. I said that introduction was very powerful. I also felt something like, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's just this, uh, you know, like we tend to deny memories. I didn't. I don't know if that's, but the, I feel, I mean, the speaker feels that memories do seem to have this kind of a power like over, over the persona. It's like, like, like there is like sort of fear, there's guilt, there's a whole lot of things that come through with memories. So how do we deal with that? How are we going to deal with those feelings? Yes, because of like, like kind of like like the guilt and the the fear and a whole lot of things that seem to bubble up. Well, may, well, maybe you don't have to deal with them. I mean, the um, um, again. So what we call negative feelings, uh, we, we're so conditioned to, to say that they are an indication that something is wrong and that something needs to be done and they, these feelings need to be dealt with. Who says, who says they need to be dealt with? What is the deep, deep trauma, like, like trauma, you know, that comes like from your childhood, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, and if, uh, well, if there's a if there's a desire to deal with them, then that's probably what will happen. And this uh, this is no suggestion that any of that is wrong in any way at all. But then I I couldn't I couldn't make a suggestion of you need to deal with things in a certain way because that would imply a method. Well, it's just that. It, everything just happens naturally. So if you, you, if there's a desire to seek help for trauma, then there's seeking help for trauma. Um, and if a friend- You wouldn't say therapy, you wouldn't say therapy is the way to go, but you would say that that kind of a thing will happen will happen if it needs to. I, I wouldn't have any qualms about uh, saying that somebody, I wouldn't say that somebody should go to therapy or shouldn't, but uh, it's because therapy isn't right or wrong and therapy can help, certainly with trauma in the story can help me feel better about those traumatic memories and feel better about my story. And so understanding in the story, understanding can help a lot. Can help me. But that's not Thank what we're speaking, about. we're speaking about something else. I mean, this is a story that is just stories. 
And so this isn't a story about how to improve the story. It's saying that all the stories are just as they are. Not this, this isn't an improvement. This, the, the, the radical difference between this and most other meetings, discussions, groups, message, you could say, is that this doesn't have a prescription of how to make life better because there isn't a better life. There is just life for better or worse exactly as it is it isn't there is no prescription full stop but it has but 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 like you sorry i'm just trying to keep using the word but and yeah. all we can say is that these are things that occur within the dream is this yeah Thanks, Razi. Tom has a hand up. Who has? Tom. Tom. Oh, I just had a, um, I don't know. Everything I say about this is wrong, but um, I, it seems like this is more like a validation of everything to me. I mean, in my mind, I think of it as like, so when I come here, it's more validating of everything. And it seems like a lot of what's going on everywhere else is like a reductionistic kind of thing. They're trying to reduce this into some kind of like there's a path mm -hmm. to here, right way to be, you know, there's hope, there's hope, you know, whatever, you know, it's yeah. just like this whole, I don't know, I just feel that sense of kind of restriction when I get, a, you know, like when I listen to most spiritual teachers and here it just seems like validating of everything. But I don't know. That's just my comment, I guess. Well, oh, that's a nice comment, Tom. Yeah, you could, it could feel like validation, but of course this, this is regardless of validation or not. So it, I could see how, I could see how it could sound and maybe feel like. See, I'm doing the same thing as I'm, I'm always trying to reduce everything too, you know, Yeah. So even like, oh yeah, it's validation. Yeah. 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 Well, the thing about reductionism is of course, it's just trying to understand that's all. So in, you, you want to understand the machine, you take it to pieces and then you put it back together again, and then you understand how it works. Well, that's, that's fine with a, with a, uh, with an engine, but with life, that's not, you know, how, how on earth would that work? And so, yeah, this is, um, this is the destruction of reductionism in that sense. It could be, it's like, you've tried everything, haven't you? You've analyzed, yeah. you've, you've <laughs> taken, you've taken everything apart. You've, and you know, you, you've tried, you've tried as many ways to take this apart as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, none of them have worked. Right. And so maybe there's nothing wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the suggestion. I mean, you can't get, <laughs> you can't get more radical than saying, in this world, particularly when everyone keeps saying to me, I have loads of people saying to me, well, it's just getting worse, isn't it? I went, well, I seem to remember all the adults saying that when I was seven or eight years old, I can hear them saying, you know, the world is going to rack and ruin. We, everything is going to shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I don't, because self loves that. And then, then it can set about, okay, I'll join with other human beings to put it right, because we, we've worked out a plan, how to make life better for me and you and everyone else. But maybe there's nothing wrong. But of course, if there's nothing wrong, which self can almost, self likes the idea that there's nothing wrong. What, what self doesn't like is that, of course, if nothing is wrong, then nothing is right. Mm -hmm. 
because it so this isn't this isn't I hear a lot of speakers talk about this as perfection and what I'm speaking of is the death of perfection perfection is simply another human ideal an idea a fantasy of what could be now this isn't what could be it is exactly as it is so I, I can kind of go with perfectly imperfect, but, but not perfection. And I, I do hear quite a few people talk about this as perfection. Um, there's no end to finding fault with how life appears. What I'm suggesting is that's perfectly okay. It's human nature. I haven't stopped finding fault with my golf swing <laughs> or politics or, you know, the formation of my favorite football team. Finding fault is just natural. But there can be a, when, when it isn't about that, there isn't any, there isn't actually a problem with finding fault with life. The problem is that it needs fixing. Mm -hmm. And then saying about how to fix it. The finding fault is absolutely natural. In fact, it can really feel loving. But the but the the insistence that because I've I don't like that because all finding fault is I like I'd like it another way, not this way. Well, life is always this way, and um, my insistence that I could make it better by having it my way. I mean, they're suffering because immediately you're in conflict with all the other human beings who also have their opinions about how to improve life and make it a better way. But there really is no way. There's no way to here. And this doesn't lead away from here either. So there is no road to get here and there's no path leading away from here. And of course, if there isn't somewhere else, then there's no here either. Because here only, here only has any substance if there's there. There is no here without there. Michelle has a question. Who is it, Dan? Michelle. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi, Tim. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm still laughing at life doesn't give a shit about you, even though I've heard you say it many times, but. <laughs> I really don't tire of saying that. <laughs> so Tim, as you were saying, like there's no right or wrong in receiving therapy or not. No. But ultimately it doesn't matter. Like it's not gonna fix anything. Well, it can well, it can seemingly, it can seemingly make the story better. But that's just more of the loop, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so well, what it, it well, how I see therapy now is that it it can it can make me feel more comfortable in my story. And I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all, because for most, for most human beings, they're never going to hear this. What we're speaking of, I don't know if you've noticed how few people can hear this at all. And by hear it, I mean that it even registers as you're talking about, well, that it makes, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but they, they just won't hear it. So for most, for most human beings, um, yeah, therapy, therapy is beneficial 
to make me make me feel happier, more comfortable, more secure in my knowledge and my understanding. So I talk about that all knowledge and understanding is illusory. Well, for somebody who's in great distress about their, their story, uh, particularly about traumatic memories and experiences, then uh, there's no point in saying that to them. I mean, there's no point in any of it, but this, what I mean is it's not gonna help. Mm -hmm. So you could say relatively, of course, it is helpful. Absolutely, no, there's no, because there is no help. There's no one to help. So relatively useful, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the same for everything. That's the same for everything, exactly, yeah. 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 So, it, but for me, it's no different to, you know, I've, I had COVID in, in, while I was in America. Of course, I took as much medication as I could, whatever would make me feel better. Well, it's the same. It's exactly the same as going to a therapist, isn't it? This isn't, I'm not saying if you have a headache, don't take paracetamol because there's no one to feel better about not having a headache. Mm -hmm. it's very natural for a human being to do whatever they can to alleviate pain whether it's emotional pain psychological pain or physical pain that's just natural and that's what everyone and of course it would be literally insane to suggest oh no you shouldn't do that because there's no one to be helped So I, I see psychological help just the same as physically. It's no different. If that's what happens. Because I think ultimately you'd say you don't choose anyway, really. No, no one chooses, but there is choosing, though, seemingly. So seemingly there's a choice to go to a therapist. Yeah. Now, these, I think people get a little hooked up. You can get a bit hooked up in that, in that because there's no one choosing, there won't be a choosing. No, choosing seems to happen. I mean, that's, this isn't mysterious in the sense of, okay, without you, there won't be any sense of choosing. No, there's a sense of choosing. It's just that there's no chooser. I mean, it's a bit like saying, yeah, you'll never have a shower again. Without me, because I'm the showerer, I'm the one who does the showering. I choose to have a shower. So without me, there would never, there would be no showering again because I am the chooser of the showering. Mm -hmm. No, there's choosing to have a shower, seemingly. Just no one doing it. Yeah. And you won't know the difference between the two. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Because there isn't any difference. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, this is the big, this is the joke of all jokes that selves are waiting until they know the absence of themselves and then they will know themselves as a no self. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there isn't anything funnier. It's not funny because I was in, I've got memories of being in that place for years of won't myself just fuck off and leave me alone. Well, how would I fuck off and leave me alone? I mean, I don't know, but that's what I was demanding. Hmm. <laughs> so there... <laughs> So this isn't about losing yourself. It's about that there isn't a self. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> and so, I mean, what would be the most liberating thing that most selves can imagine is I have nothing to lose. You know, people who are close to death. So you, you, you go to the doctor and you went, I've got some bad news, Mr. Kless. You've got three and a half weeks at best. 
well, what am I going to do? I mean, there's no telling how a human being would react to that. But really, well, there's nothing to lose. Better get on with it. So I'm going to do everything that is still on my bucket list because I've got nothing to lose. And nothing to lose is liberating. And of course, what, what most human beings fear to lose most of all is me. I, that's my greatest fear. I can't even imagine the absence of myself. Or the image, yeah. the image of the self. Yeah. 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 Which is all by its nature bullshit anyway. It has to be because. <laughs> like, well, well it, well, it is just an image. Yeah, that's why I could say illusory. And that's, I, I haven't really got a better word because self-image is just that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a bit more than that. I could say it's more than that because it is a felt sense of feeling inside, of feeling separate, of feeling detached, of feeling, feeling apart. So rather than being... Rather than this being whole, it's in parts. And I am the separate part that is watching all the other parts. I am, but I'm I'm apart from everyone else, everything else. There's me and there's everything else, and that's not me. That's the illusion. Yeah. There really isn't. There are there is the appearance of of separate human beings and separate dogs and cats and trees and flowers. That's naturally how life appears. But there isn't any one, they aren't separate entities apart from each other. You know, a flower doesn't have a sense of itself apart from other flowers and everything else. It just doesn't have a sense of it. Just us and our gigantic brains. <laughs> the curse of the big brain. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Razia has a hand up. Razia. I was gonna ask you, you see, like, like the last speaker was speaking about loops. You know, it's getting into a loop, like kind of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but then uh, when you look at it, like, like Nazaka Data now, he said, uh, meditate on I am that, you know? And Ramana would say, reductionalist, I mean, yeah, reductionalism, like. Uh, what you are not, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the thoughts, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So they're always like suggesting methods, you know? Yeah. And if you look at it, most of the people that have attained this, even uh, like, like Michael or Nancy or, or, or any of the others, they have been using methods. Mm -hmm. they, were, they have used every method you know to get yeah. to this but yeah. now i'm thinking what's with this like why 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 can't people meditate or do things you know to get this like i mean i mean you know because everyone has been using well, do, you, do you think i'm i'm do you think i'm saying medit meditation is wrong yeah, no, because that's what people are saying. Oh, there's no methods, there's no practices. No, you don't well, have to do anything, you know? It no. Well, well, it's very obvious that there's nothing to be done. So, of course, uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 pr I'm prone to say it doesn't matter what you do. But I'm, but equally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make anything. There's no correct, so there's no incorrect. This, this is, again, life isn't interested in, it couldn't give a shit what you do. Yeah. I mean, haven't you noticed? I mean, this is, it can, if, this, if this is really noticed, then again, it can feel devastating. Not only, can, because you can't be seen by any other, you may have noticed 
<laughs> that other human beings, unless it impinges on their story and their life, nobody has the slightest interest in what you are doing, what you are feeling, what you are loving, what you are hating, in your opinions, your beliefs. They couldn't give a shit. I mean, that is love. No, it's not a love that you wanted because you want to be included. Well, you won't be included. There's no one to be included or excluded. This is absolutely, absolutely whole. All of it. There is nothing that's included and nothing that's excluded. That's just your desire in your fear of separation and being alone. Well, this is completely alone. There is no... The aloneness is total. And that is not what you want. Don't pretend it's what you want. I know you don't. It's what you fear most. You will never meet another or know another or be at one with another. There is no one to be at one with another. It's devastatingly wonderful. Mr. Williams, it's lovely to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, great stuff, Tim. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, that's a pleasantry, it's over. Um, no, it's just, I just kind of have a thing to finish up on, perhaps. But, um, you know, while we're, most of us anyway, and I know we don't exist, are stuck in this... Uh, Purgatory, really, that's what it is, isn't it? Um, in this business of art, I'm, I'm very taken with and its function or not in this whole thing. And um, all I'm wanting to do is to uh, flag up a beautiful piece of music I heard this week from someone just relentlessly seeking. I mean, it just, it's so pathetic. But that energy, that seeking energy, it's incredibly powerful, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, Paul Simon. He's got a new album out. And it's fucking off the scale. He's 82 years old. And you just have to learn an awful lot of non dual things in there. Of course, the non dual police would take <laughs> through it because he's using relative means. Oh. It's called Seven Psalms. So there's Psalms, he calls them. And he... The minute, the first line I heard, I'm going to hate this. He keeps talking about the Lord. And of course, I'm, you know, as a, you know, failed Catholic, I just freaked out completely. By the end, I was totally convinced. Oh. Because, you know, the, what's, what's, um, let me see, for example, the Lord is the COVID virus. The oceans rising are the Lord. And you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, this is a different take. And, you know, it's, that's just a fraction of it. And of course, it's one piece. It lasts for 30 minutes. You may not be interested in guitar playing. I mean, I know that Darren is, but I've never heard anything like it in my life. And yeah. it's just pared down. It's an acoustic guitar and voice mm -hmm. with some little things. But what a way to go out. It's just well stunning. And lovely as these meetings are, I mean, we adore them, don't we? I get the same from listening. I'm so lucky. Yeah. Well, I, I don't understand the language, as it were, but yeah. it's, it's fabulous. Oh, I find music is, um, yeah, it's, I mean, every, everything is an expression. Yes, of course, yeah. If, and if, the, if it's seen or heard, but yeah. music for mm. most, most of us is probably the, the most uh, This is challenging. I mean, you, it really is a challenging piece of music. Oh, I'll have a list. I'll definitely have a listen. It's so fearless. You're talking about, because a lot of people are going to listen to that and think, what's he banging on about? Yeah. Lord got a five-star review in the guardian this week you can't ignore it it's brilliant right anyway enough said well i'm i'm really prone to play it, but. <laughs> but you know i would suggest 
we'd listen to it 10 times and then come to a conclusion. You know. It's only 30 minutes, the whole thing, and it's called Seven Psalms. Um, so there we are. That's just me throwing my tuppence well. Oh, but it does, it relates to this. It relates to what we've been talking about very I'll much. Have, I'll definitely have a listen, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks, David. <laughs> no, it's lovely. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. It's been lovely. Um, I've got... Have you got time for one more question, Tom? Yeah, who's that? Has Tom had his hand up? Yeah, sure. Go on, Tom. Oh, do I still have my hand up? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what was I going to say? I forgot. I got lost in Paul Simon. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> it does sound great. We'll all have a listen. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, I'm I'm at um, I'm in Hampstead in two weeks' time on the seventeenth of June. Um, and I'll have another meeting next Thursday, hopefully. Hey, Tim, it's Karen. Hi, Karen. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, go on. Don't, I don't know how to raise my hand on this darn thing. I keep looking, but at any rate, um, my question is about the body, if we could talk about that for a second. The, sure. So um, surprisingly, there's been quite a lot of, um, stuff that some people would call like kundalini awakening <laughs> um, here and also like the feeling of you know when you hold a newborn baby and they feel like they're going to be dropped and they they do that sort of moro response thing where they try to flap their wings and catch themselves yeah there's a lot of strange physical things going on including just waking up and this doesn't sound very lovely but like dry heaving you know tension out of the body like you know there's tension and then there's just this huge release um i you know i people don't really talk about physical stuff with the body too much you know um but there seems to be a lot of that going on so i just wondered if you had any anything to say about that anything from like like infant feelings to well like the kundalini thing they call it that but whatever that is you know i'm 70 years old so to be having well, that happen it's like what the fuck um <laughs> i don't I, I really don't have really anything to say about it you know, because i i don't feel qualified to speak about kundalini because i've no I mean, I the get, body's going through. But the, the thing is, all I would say is, what those experiences mm -hmm. are only a seeming, seemingly extraordinary. Out they of, don't. Out of they you. don't feel extraordinary. They feel disturbing. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what I mean. And so the yeah. extraordinary, well, that's the thing about out of the ordinary. It is disturbing. Well, I don't usually have this experience. This, my right. body doesn't usually feel this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, Karen, all I would say is so now in spirituality, there's so many, you know, those experiences would be made a big deal of. Right. And there would be a lot of story of what they mean. Right. And if you're asking my opinion, which you are, they mean nothing. That's my my assumption is that, you know, that it seems to have started happening with this message. The more I listen to this message, the more the physical body has these very yeah. bizarre responses. So and I guess I was asking, did you go through anything like right. that? Right. And if you want, if you want some, <laughs> if you want some tim's story then yes there were lots of unusual different extraordinary physical experiences yeah okay all yeah. right lots of them and of course what i did then was research them and try to make sense of them i didn't make any sense of them but i did try to i made no bloody sense of them at all right 
because okay. really, really all bodily experience is just free and there is nothing more significant than any other. But of course, in spirituality, and that's what Kundalini is all about, is it means this. You have this bodily experience, well, what it indicates is this. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saying it indicates nothing, along with everything else. So it's equal to everything else. It's just yeah. nothing. It's yeah. nothing. Well, it's yeah. just, yeah. And, but I would also say that is an, as a reassurance in that that might not sound reassuring, because, but of course it is, because it is no different from what you've called the ordinary. And the illusion is that you know the ordinary, so I'm okay with that, but this I don't know. So what the fuck is going on? Something, some, it's something wonderful or something dreadful or a bit of both, or, but it's not what I know. And the whole illusion is that you know normal and this is this is extraordinary well it turns out the ordinary and the extraordinary are not two mm. the illusion is that i know the ordinary and the extraordinary are two. well this is all equally ordinary and equally extraordinary this happening which is all there is and all we do all self does is tell stories of the mundane that I know. I know what that is. I know how it works. I know how this is. And the absolute, the wonderful, the spiritual, the unknowable. So we divide. So what self does it divide life into knowable and unknowable and then makes this false division when everything is equally. Mm -hmm. equally unknown the illusion is that i do know anything this is this is still being recorded right um, my phone rang while you were talking so I, it cut you part way off so i'm gonna have to listen back to what you said sorry. you're talking away but my phone is ringing and i'm trying to shut it off well, I wouldn't worry about that either, Karen, because these words are as empty as empty could be. Well, I knew you'd get a kick out of that. I was like, oh, no. I asked, I asked the question I've been dying to ask, and then it gets cut off. <laughs> um, but I'll listen back to it. Tim, thank yeah, you. But, but I understand that they, when when there's experiences that you've not had before, or there's no memory of having them before, then they do feel threatening. And because... Right you want to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit terrifying, but then it seems to pass through. It's, it's, yeah. There's nothing I can do about it. If people say, oh, just accept it as it is. It's like, well, that's impossible. You know, like who would do that when you're really uncomfortable? No, like, that's, I, that's I, weird no, if, <laughs> no, if, there, if there's resistance to the then that's what's happening. It's, yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for taking the extra time. Oh, really appreciate okay. it. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, lovely to see you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Cheers, Kim. Cheers, Darren. Thanks, Tim. Cheers, Tim. Thanks, Darren. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Tim.